are there, but we want to uh, be together as we sing to you and with you in your hearts. So, so that you understand, our first piece uh, is not in English, neither is our second piece, which is coming later. But um, this is a South African freedom song called Xochiloza, and uh, it comes from the apartheid era in South Africa, and uh, to, to vastly simplify, uh, the, the translation is to go forward, to go over the mountains to a place of freedom and liberation. So I hope you enjoy Xochiloza. with you. It's a delight to have as our guest speaker in chapel today our Downey lecturer this week, Dr. Elaine Storkey, and she'll be introduced to you a little bit later. I want to fit in a little reminder to all of you who are in chapel worship teams that there is a mini workshop immediately following chapel today. Meet right here at the front as soon as we're over. Only take 10 minutes. Please would you rise in body or in spirit and join me in our call to worship. You'll see it on the screen. And please would you respond by saying the text in bold. Let us worship the eternal God, the source of love and life who creates us. Let us worship the Spirit, the holy fire who renews us. To the one true God be praise in all times and places through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue to lift up our hearts and our voices as we praise our God.
is redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given in vain. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life from Psalm 103. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Let us continue to sing the praises of our God, our deliverer, our savior, God with us. Oh, you've come to bring peace to big love to be nearer to us so you've come to bring life to shine that's my bad (laughs) to shine brighter in us so we met you
our deliverer. so awestruck to be standing in your presence today. We praise you for your goodness that you've come for us wherever we are at in our lives and you meet us there and you do not leave us there. Yeah, God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love that just never fails. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Uh, my name is Philip Picard. Uh, I'm a second year seminary student pursuing uh, my MABTS. Uh, in order to share what God has been doing in my life, I need to provide you with some history. I grew up in Calgary with an older and younger brother, my mother, and a father who suffered from severe depression. He rarely spoke a word, but after a long night of drinking, would burst into a violent rage and take out his anger on our family. This began when I was five years old uh, and was so incredibly terrifying that I began to suffer with a severe case of post-traumatic stress disorder. As a result, uh, I experienced reoccurring nightmares, uh, extreme hypervigilance, uncontrollable thoughts, and difficulty forming my speech. As an escape from our trials at home, my mother began taking my brothers and I to an Anglican church where I became uh, incredibly fascinated by stories in the New Testament where Jesus saved people from their suffering. But I found it uh, uh, nearly impossible to believe that God would... Sorry, computer problems? Okay. Those are other kind of trials. Sorry. Um, uh, but I found it com uh, in, almost impossible to believe uh, that God would... Uh, ever help someone as unimportant as me. Uh, my earthly father never spoke a word, uh, so how could I expect anything from a heavenly father? When I turned 15, I began drinking and smoking marijuana uh, in an attempt to alleviate my pain. Uh, my life had become increasingly meaningless and where I gradually began to hate myself. Uh, and this turned into uh, a uh, mission to where I became determined to destroy myself. After three and a half years of addiction, I had completely lost my ability to speak, which continued on for an additional two years. Uh, in a state of utter isolation and depression, I could see my life about to fall in, into an unending chasm of despair. In a last ditch effort I, uh, to turn my life around, I began attending uh, the Anglican church and began to pray. Uh, then after a year and a half, I found myself at a healing conference with a torrent of confusion coursing through my mind. Uh, but when the speaker at the conference prayed, I was powerfully touched by the Holy Spirit. Uh, about a month later, I found a small prayer meeting in Calgary uh, where members sought the Holy Spirit for healing and attended this church four to five times a week over the next 15 years. Uh, although I have faced profound difficulty in my life where it has taken nearly five decades uh, to overcome the effects of PTSD, I would not trade it for anything. Uh, because of my tremendous need, I have seen the power of God. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Uh, through this, I have also come to believe that we were never ever meant to go through this life alone. Uh, I am convinced that the greatest thing that you could ever achieve in this lifetime is a relationship of dependency 
uh, with the everlasting God. Your weakness may be a perfect opportunity for God's miraculous strength. Uh, by this, I want to encourage you to never give up, uh, never be ashamed of your weakness, and always look to God. Uh, Isaiah 59.1 uh, says, Listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor his ear too deaf to hear you call. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you will bless every one here with a greater measure of your Holy Spirit and a deeper revelation of your everlasting love. Amen. Thank you, Philip. Today I have the privilege of introducing our Downey lecturer, and it's not often that we can stand up here and actually introduce somebody that we know. But Dr. Elaine Storkey has been what in Old Testament times we would call our rabbi, someone who I have studied with, someone who the dust of her sandals has washed up on me. And to be honest, the only reason I have a PhD is because of the work that Dr. Elaine Storkey did with me, and that's why I can be here. So I'm very, very honored and privileged to introduce her to you today. Dr. Storkey has taught both here in North America and also in England at a variety of different schools, including Oxford, the Open University, and Cambridge. Along with her teaching as a philosopher, sociologist, and theologian, Dr. Storkey has done radio broadcasting for over 25 years in a number of different programs, including a regular uh, contributor to BBC programming. Dr. Storkey has a huge passion for working with and among women that are marginalized, and her most recent book, Scars Across Humanity, published by IVP Academic, available in our bookstore, documents just the extent of violence against women in not only our culture here in North America, but around the world. I don't know how many of you were at Downey last night at the lecture. Please come again and bring friends. We were privileged to really learn a lot last night and to start thinking about hope and the ways in which the church can respond. Tonight, Dr. Storky will be speaking extensively about domestic violence in our context and how we as a church can and should respond. So I really encourage all of you to come out tonight. Um, before we um, bring Dr. Storky up though, can I just say a quick word of prayer for her as well? Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much that your mercies are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. We are so thankful to have Dr. Storkey with us this morning. And we just ask, Lord, that you would give her just your wisdom, your strength, and your spirit's anointing and guiding as she leads us this morning. God, we are so grateful for your word, for your parables, and the ways in which that you continue to teach us through your ancient word. So open the eyes of our hearts and our ears, and may we just listen to where the Spirit is calling us through the word you are about to give us. We pray and we ask for these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. So our prayer, our liturgical prayer for the morning is, God, prepare the soul of our hearts so that as your word is sown through reading and preaching, it may take root and mature and come to harvest in the life of the world through Jesus Christ, the sower of the seed. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went about at nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And at about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idly all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, 
These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat? But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this to you as the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. It is indeed a privilege to be with you today and to open the Word of God together. It's interesting when you look at Jesus' parables to ask, what are they really about? And very often there's not just one simple answer, as there isn't with this parable. It's incidentally, it's quite important to <clears throat> realize that when Jesus tells a parable, God, in person, rarely features. There's nearly always a stand-in for God. Sometimes it's a rich man. Sometimes, like in this passage, <clears throat> it's a landowner, an owner of vast resources. So the focus is on the landowner, and getting to know the landowner, we're invited to get to know God better. So what is a parable about? I grew up in an era where people were quite sure what the parable was about because of the people who came at the 11th hour and actually found access to the vineyard and to the vineyard owner and the same basis as those who had been working all day. And we saw this spiritually as a story about the 11th hour conversion, that even if we've lived dissolute lives, even if our lives have been empty and hollow, we can still come to God because nothing is ended until the final whistle blows. And it gives great hope for people who are praying for relatives or friends or struggling as missionaries in very barren areas to know that until we breathe our last, it's always possible to come to God in penitence and faith and God will receive us. God will bless us. There can be an 11th hour conversion. But the parable, I believe, is much more than that. There are layers and layers of meaning. And I just want to look at three other meanings in this parable. Because the second is about Christ's relationship with Jew and Gentile. Have you noticed that the people who were there at the very beginning are the people who are usually chosen, the ones who are picked, the ones who work? They are the people who are waiting to do the work. They know that they will go into the vineyard. They already probably know the vineyard owner. They are the people, the regular expected people. And in the parable, they are the Jews. And they're walking with God from the beginning. God has chosen them as his people. And they walk with God. And bit by bit, more and more of them are added as generations go on through the day, the next generation and the one after that come and continue the work that God has given them to do in his world. And then lo and behold, before the day closes, at five o'clock, there's a whole bunch of other people who are admitted into the work, and they come from a different position. They come from having been standing around all day, but not part of those who have been formally chosen. And when payment comes, who are the ones who grumble? They're the ones who have been with God from the very beginning, been with the landowner from the very beginning, and worked the whole day. They've been the ones who've borne the sweat of the brow, the heat of the day. They've been the ones who put their backs into the work. And now these usurpers, who've only come in for an hour, are getting the same treatment as we are. And of course, the landowner rebukes that response. It's up to him and his generosity to include those who come in the very last. And so the Gentiles come into the kingdom of God into salvation through Jesus Christ on exactly the same basis as the Jews, namely through the death of Christ, as we know. There is no distinction between Jew and Gentile because Christ has broken down those human barriers that we erect between us. So the story really 
is a story for the Jewish hearers, that they cannot see themselves uniquely and only as the people of God, because God is no respecter of persons, and he draws the Gentiles in too. The third meaning, of course, is about the difference between law and grace. Notice in the story how the first people, there's a very kind of busy and active engagement and arrangement about how they're going to do the work. He agrees with the laborers a contract. He gives them a contract for the usual daily wage. The contract is drawn up, the agreement is made, and they go off to work. Three hours later, he does the same. A contract is drawn up, I will pay you what is right. We don't know whether he's going to pay them less or more, but what is right will be decided by the contract. And there's a third hint of contract in the third group of people who come in. But look at the ones who come in the 11th hour at five o'clock in the afternoon. He gives them no contract. He just says, okay, get into the vineyard. Why have you been standing around all day? And they said, because nobody's hired us. Okay, I'll hire you. Off you go into the vineyard. No contract, no law protecting them. They go in at the mercy of the landowner. And actually, what's exciting about the story is that they receive far, far more in actual generous terms than those who've lived by the contract and worked by the contract, who have actually seen the Torah, the law of God, as a central point of their relationship with the landowner. Interesting. And these people have actually just thrown themselves on the grace of God because there's nothing else they can do. They've thrown themselves on the mercy of the landowner, and the landowner has actually drawn them in grace. He hasn't paid them back what they deserve. He's given them far more. He's given them what they do not deserve, the gracious benefit of his generosity and his compassion and his love. And the story there, the meaning there, is if we live by the law alone, if we're legalistic people, if we tie ourselves into the contract only, we miss the grace of God. Because grace is much bigger than law. Grace is much greater because it looks at us in our human broken and damaged state and loves us nevertheless. It doesn't hold our failures, our weakness against us, but just blesses us through the grace and goodness of Jesus Christ. And I think there's a fourth meaning in the parable too. And this is about exploitation and justice. Look at the people who are coming to do the work in the vineyard. The first category will be the people, the usual suspects, those who know how to work the system. Those who are there, they know how to turn up, they know how to look, they've got the muscles. They're the ones who are always picked. <clears throat> They're the ones who work well. They're the ones whom the world serves well. They're the ones who usually take home the paychecks. They're the ones who can make things work to their advantage. And the second group too, probably less so in the third group, but the fourth group still hanging around and having hung around all day long. And the landowner says to them, why have you stood idle all day? Note that word, idle because their response is, this is not our choice. <coughs> we haven't chosen to stand here idle all day, but nobody has hired us. We have no work. We have no assets. We have no resources. All we have is our hands and labor, and no one has hired us. And isn't that a picture of our world today? That those people who can milk the system and work the system will be okay. They can look after themselves. Those who cannot are often left in a position of vulnerability and fragility. But what about the landowner? What do landowners do? What do international corporations do in situations like this? Well, they take advantage of those who are idle all day because they know that they will work for anything, peanuts, anything, because they too have mouths to feed. 
They too have families to go home to. They too have children who will be hungry. They too have homes and shelters to provide for their families. They need the work. They need the money. They need the resources. And so they are the great exploitable mass that actually exist in our world today. And unscrupulous corporations, very often transnational corporations, unscrupulous owners can cherry pick very easily those who will work for nothing. They can set up business in some poor economy, exploit that economy, pay a dollar a day, and then when the workers say, but we can't live off a dollar a day, they can uproot and move to another economy where they can get workers to work almost for nothing. This is a picture that I, as president of Tier Fund, experienced over and over again going to the poorest areas of the world. Why were they idle all day? Not because they didn't want to work, not because they didn't want to feed their families, but because nobody had hired them. The resources were not there to pay them the wage. They couldn't bring the harvest in because the money that they would get from selling the harvest was not enough to feed the families. And it got worse and worse with climate change and all the other things that are happening in our world. And what do, it's a capitalist dream. It's a ruthless capitalist dream. The exploit, the people who can be exploited so that the people who cannot be exploited live wealthy, rich, and abundant lives. And what does this landowner do? He does the very reverse. He refuses to exploit. He honors the poor. He honors those who had no work, who were unable to feed their families, and he pays them the same as the ones who have actually been picked and know how to milk the system and know how to get the best resources for themselves. This is a picture of grace and justice and mercy where justice isn't tit for tat, where justice isn't just contractual honoring, but justice is looking at the need and the person and the humanity that calls out loud for freedom and for justice. When I was much younger, I used to puzzle over the last sentence of our reading. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Never really understood what it meant, until I asked my 10-year-old son many years ago now, what's it mean, do you think? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. And he laughed. I said, well, it's obvious, Mum. If the last are first, and the first are also last, then everybody's equal. Well, I don't get your problem. <laughs> and of course, he was absolutely right. If the first are last and the last first, they're standing together on the finishing line, side by side. There are no hierarchies. There are no firsts and lasts. They are people together sharing humanity before God, waiting to be blessed by God equally, fully. Not identically, because God blesses us according to our need and according to our person and according to our circumstances and according to who we are. It's not an identical picture. It's a picture where our individuality is respected along with our functionality in this world. So which of these interpretations of the parable is the right one? That's a silly question. The answer is they all are. Because in our interpretations of this parable, we build up a picture of God who is like the landowner and the kingdom of God who is like the activity of the landowner. The kingdom of God is like this, says Jesus over and over again in the Gospel of Matthew. The kingdom of God is like this. It's a kingdom of justice. It's a kingdom of mercy. It's a kingdom of compassion. It's a kingdom of goodness. It's a kingdom of caring for the vulnerable, protecting the weak, ensuring that no one goes hungry, ensuring that the children are protected, the hungry are fed, the naked are clothed, the destitute are housed. This is a picture of the kingdom of God through the activities of a landowner who will not exploit, who doesn't just go tit for tat, who is generous and gracious and benevolent and who loves us all. And we are 
his body and how we will put his kingdom into practice in our world is the question we must ask ourselves today. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Ambrose University singers would like to give voice to our response this morning, and uh, we will be singing in Hebrew, so I'd like to give you the text from Psalm 131. Lord, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too wonderful for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. And from Psalm 133, behold how good and how pleasant it is for the people of God to dwell together in unity. We will take your silence rather than your applause as our joint ascent this morning. So after we finish singing, I will uh, give a blessing and we will be dismissed. <laughs> 